But when we looked at the, uh, the liver mRNA uh, using a, a microarray, there were several genes that were upregulated in the high energy palettes that are associated with inflammation. So haptoglobin, uh, several forms of serum amyloid A uh, were the, the primary ones that, that would indicate inflammation in the liver. Hello everyone, my name is Luis Ferrero, and I'm one of the hosts of the Dairy Nutrition Black Belt podcast. And today we have the privilege of receiving uh, Dr. Jean Drakeley from the University of Illinois. Could you please give us a brief background about yourself? Sure. Well, I'm professor of animal sciences at the University of Illinois in, in Urbana-Champaign. I've been in that position for more than 34 years now. And uh, originally from uh, Minnesota and went to school at South Dakota State and Iowa State University. And then I've been here at the University of Illinois the rest of my career, um, involved in, in research and teaching. And I also have a, a number of outreach uh, functions that I that I do as well. Obviously, we know we all know your work quite well. We know and all the the great research related to how to best implement transition cow diets. And the topic that I would like to discuss with you today is about a recent abstract that you put together this previous ADSA meeting discussing about you know energy levels in the diet of dry cows and how that can affect uh, the postpartum period for those cows. Could you give us a perspective on that? Yeah. Well, as, as many people probably know, we've been working on the idea of controlled energy uh, rations for dry cows for many years. And um, one of the, the phenomenon that we wanted to investigate was, was whether these diets were less inflammatory than uh, higher energy close-up diets. Um, we, we had interest in inflammation for uh, probably 25 years or so, and of course it's gotten a lot more attention recently with Barry Bradford and Lance Bongard leading the, the way on, on those aspects. And so we wanted to use our model uh, comparing the, the controlled energy diet to a higher energy close-up and see if there was more evidence uh, for, for inflammation on one diet or the other. So we, we had two groups of cows, one that was fed a controlled energy diet and one that was fed a higher energy close-up diet. And we put those on, I put the cows on those two groups, two diets during the dry period, and then put them on a common lactation ration after calving. And we didn't see much difference in terms of production uh, variables or uh, blood and liver variables, you know, liver composition, and so on, that would be uh, that we would have expected given our previous results. Uh, there's a relatively small number of cows on the study, so it, it perhaps it's not surprising we didn't detect any significant differences. But when we looked at the uh, the liver mRNA uh, using a, a microarray. There were several genes that were upregulated in the high energy cows that are associated with inflammation. So haptoglobin, uh, several forms of serum amyloid A uh, were the, the primary ones that, that would indicate inflammation in the liver. And so it, it appeared um, similar to a, a previous study that we had done that that uh, for some reason, the higher energy diets, higher starch close up diets are more inflammatory in the liver than the, the controlled energy program. So is it safe to say that even though this specific study uh, did not show any impact on production, intake, and some of the most common variables that we are used to seeing some of those studies, that this higher inflammation uh, is something that we should be very careful about and can have huge implications for the uh, for this cow throughout her uh, lactation period? Yes, I think so. Um, it, there's there's certainly good evidence from from Bongard and, and Bradford's work and others, uh, including Giuseppe Bertoni and and uh, Emilio Teresi in Italy, 
uh, that inflammation has negative effects on the cow. It draws resources away from production, uh, interferes with, with normal functions of the liver and other, other tissues. So uh, it may be another factor that links in the, the generally um, more favorable transitions that we see with cows on a controlled energy program relative to a, a, a higher energy, high starch, close up diet. So I think it's a, another part of the puzzle and perhaps can be a, a pretty important piece of that puzzle. Yeah, absolutely. I do think that, you know, uh, the health of dairy cows is one of the key aspects for any nutritionist and, and definitely this adds a lot of value to our literature. Um, if you don't mind me asking, you know, for the young nutritionists out there, you know, uh, learning how to formulate and best to implement some of those control mm -hmm. energy diets uh, on dairy farms, uh, what are your recommendations on how to start and things to pay close attention to avoid any issues with some yeah. of those diets? So I think the, the big issue, we, we use energy or controlled energy to talk about it, but I think that that the uh, most important aspect is the starch content of the diet. So we want to keep starch down to a, a level of, of probably 15 to 16 percent of the dry matter in the close-up ration. Uh, this is enough to help the, the rumen adaptation, but um, uh, we, we think can help avoid some of these negative effects. So the, the net energy of the diet will be somewhere in the, the range of one point uh, four to one point five, probably, uh, but again, that's driven by the the starch content. And what we're talking about typical Midwest or or northeastern U.S. diets here with uh, with a fair amount of corn silage, and then using wheat straw or other cereal straws to to bring down the energy density and control the the starch content. Yeah, thank you. No, those are definitely great recommendations. And I, I highly agree with you, you know, if you have enough energy there to just stimulate the room and to continue to work and develop the microbial community, but keeping the cow healthy uh, is, is definitely key. Right. And when it comes to those issues associated with the inflammation, uh, do you think that this is related to any, any sort of acidosis or you think that there is a completely different mechanism that is causing those issues? Yeah, that's a very good question. We don't really have the answer for that yet. We, we've done one study where we monitored rumen pH uh, as the cows approached and went through uh, calving and didn't find any neural evidence of acidosis. So it, it, it would be a, a tempting hypothesis to say that you're having some acidosis or that you're causing some uh, leaky gut issues that might uh, be a, a reason for the inflammation. But we don't have any good evidence that the, the amount of starch that we're talking about is enough to cause acidosis in the cows. Perfect. So that's, that's still kind of an unknown as to what the actual trigger is here. No, absolutely. And, I, and I'm sure, you know, we will continue to learn about, you know, some of those uh, facts as we continue with research and all the different research groups continue to elaborate on such a nice work. Um, and, and just to finalize, you know, uh, our discussion here today. So in addition to the starch levels in the diet uh, and you suggested some of the replacement of some of the concentrate or maybe corn silage with wheat straw as an example mm -hmm. uh, here for the Midwest and the Northeast. Are there any other recommendations that uh, you would have to help with the establishment of those diets? Yes, we, we still want to make sure that we're supplying adequate metabolizable protein. So uh, we, we typically agree with the recommendations of others that we should have a, a minimum of 12 to to 1,300 grams of metabolizable protein for older cows and uh, 1,100 grams or so for first calf heifers. So the, the protein um, has to be there. The vitamins and minerals uh, need to be there. So we're just we're trying to feed a balanced ration, but just control the, the starch and control the energy. Perfect. Ivonic Animal Nutrition is committed to ensure food security and safety while reducing the ecological footprint of animal farming. Its products and services use evidence-based solutions that seek to promote animal welfare and reduce reliance on natural resources. All this is underpinned by long-standing industry partnerships and deep customer understanding. 
Ivonix focus on efficiency, sustainable, healthy nutrition, and collaborations with livestock farming partners creates value for customers and consumers. Well, so, so thank you so much again for joining us today. Uh, this morning we had Dr. Jean Drakely from the University of Illinois teaching us about how to best implement and what are the implications of utilizing control energy diets for transition cows and how to actually reduce inflammation by implementing some of those diets. Uh, this was Luis Ferreira with the Dairy Nutrition uh, Black Belt Podcast and hope to see you soon. Hey everyone, we are always searching for the latest and greatest research to share weekly. If you have a dairy nutrition related research trial and would like to come on the show and share it with us, feel free to email the details of your research to hello at wisenetics.com. Thank you and hope to see you soon.